In this video, we're going to learn how to use Fusion 360 to mill the copper layer of our PCB designs. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in today's video, we're going to talk about milling PCBs using Fusion 360. Now, this is a fairly big topic, and there are a lot of variables, so I'm only going to cover the basics. We're going to look at a simple example, and then we'll look at a more complex example. But to get started, the simple example is going to be the voltage regulator that we designed in an earlier PCB series. This is probably the most basic and something that you probably would never mill, but it's important that we understand the process, and this is a great example for that. So the first thing that we need to mention is when you're designing something in Fusion 360, you have your layout, you have your schematic, and then we can push it to a 3D PCB. Now, when we push it to a 3D PCB, there are some important nuances here. If you choose 3D PCB with canvases and say, okay, the result of this is going to be a PCB where the traces are going to be a graphic. Now, when we take a look at this, we've got packages and we've got the board. Inside the board, there's only a single body, and then the canvases are going to be for the board top and the board bottom. This means you don't actually get any physical traces, which is key for us to be able to machine these. So we're going to cancel that. We're going to go back to our voltage regulator, and we're going to once again push to a 3D PCB, but we want to deselect the canvases option. We say, okay, it's gonna generate the 3D PCB, but now we'll have solid bodies for the board. Each copper layer, in this case, I'm assuming that you're on a hobbyist license, which is restricted to a two layer board, top and bottom. If you have a more complex board, obviously you're not gonna be machining the inside layers. So we have a top and a bottom, we have solder masks, and then we have the packages. So what we wanna do from here is we're gonna identify the critical components that we wanna machine. And for us in this design, it's going to be the copper on the bottom and the board. I do want to make sure that we understand a few things here. There are a couple different ways that we can do this. If we're going to be using 2D toolpaths, which are going to be one of the restrictions when you're talking about a hobbyist license, there are going to be different levels of access to toolpaths. So if you don't have 3D toolpaths, then the method that we're going to start with probably won't work for you. But just note that we have individual solid bodies and in order to better use 2D toolpaths, you'll want to combine those. That's not going to be the first example. We're going to move into 3D toolpaths first, but I just want to mention that while we're here. So the next step for me is to navigate from 3D PCB to manufacture. Again, there are limitations depending on the license that you have. If you're a hobbyist, you can still create CNC programs, but there are limitations to the toolpaths you have access to as well as the number of tool changes. I think it's a single tool change on a hobby license. Not a problem if you're using an engraver to machine these PCBs though. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna create a new setup. By default, setup will look for all of the bodies and components and it'll create a stock bounding box for that. We're gonna override that by selecting model and I'm gonna simply select the board. I don't have to include the traces, we're gonna select those later. With that, you can see that the stock is resized, but our coordinate system is pointing the wrong way. So we're gonna change the Z coordinate system, we're gonna flip it, and we're gonna select the box point and just put it in this upper left-hand corner. Then from the stock, you'll notice that it adds a little bit to the top. Right now it's one millimeter. I'm gonna say okay, and I'm gonna actually change the units of my design to inch. And if you go back into the setup, it'll automatically have converted those values for you. You can see here some rounding that happens, but I'm gonna reduce this value to 0.01. I'm gonna leave a little bit of stock on the top, but that'll just allow us to see and verify and simulation that we're actually removing material. Now that we have our stock set up and our coordinate system, let's go ahead and talk about toolpaths. There are two main toolpaths that I'm gonna focus on, but there are many ones that you can use. A 2D adaptive clearing and a 3D adaptive clearing. When we talk about adaptive clearing, what we're talking about is the motion of the tool keeping a consistent tool load. So if you're using a small machine and you're trying to remove a lot of copper, those adaptive motions are going to be much better for tool load and tool wear. But in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select from my Fusion 360 library, I'm going to look for a flat end mill. I'm going to just grab a 16th inch end mill 
I'm gonna set it to aluminum roughing and say okay. Now the values are obviously gonna be dependent on your machine and the tools that you're using. So I'm not gonna go over feeds and speeds. But once we have that, it's important to note that these 2D toolpaths are based on selected entities, whether they're chains or face selections. So this is why it's important if you go the 2D method to make sure that you actually combine geometry because it'll be much easier for you to select that geometry. So you can see here that I am able to select those chains in the outside. And if I simply say, okay, I am able to generally create a toolpath, but you can see here that it actually fails. There are a couple other settings that we might need to take a look at like stock to leave, tolerance values, as well as any additional geometry. But in general, it should be able to at least machine some of this. So again, you can see that if you have a really complex board with a lot of traces, then doing that manually takes a good bit of time. And that's why you would wanna combine them as one solid body. Because the traces do sit a little bit above the board, it will still give you edges to select. So you can see the traces are just above there. So now let's take a look at a 3D option because the 3D toolpaths are going to be model aware. And what model aware means is that it actually is looking for geometry and not based on your edge or chain selections. So I'm gonna use the same tool for the same example. Under the geometry selection, we have a machining boundary. For this example, I'm gonna use the selection and I'm gonna select the outside edge of the board. I'm gonna say, keep the tool inside that boundary. While that isn't strictly required, it does help us minimize the area in which we're machining. The stock contour, no selection is needed. The yellow box represents the stock from the setup. And if we hadn't selected the machining boundary, it would automatically machine everything inside of that stock boundary. Rest machining isn't needed because we're not gonna worry about anything that was removed from the original 2D adaptive. I'm gonna just avoid it. And then here is the key to this. We need to select the model option and we need to select the model that we wanna machine. So you'll notice here that we can select the PCB traces. So that copper layer is what we wanna use, but we wanna deselect include setup model. That's gonna be important because the setup model didn't include these. We wanna make sure that we deselect that option. For the heights, I'm gonna use the selection of the board face because remember the copper is a little bit taller. So this will at least let us know if we're on the right track. Then in my passes section, I'm gonna turn off stock to leave and I'm gonna say okay to everything else. So once again, it goes in with this adaptive motion and in general, a 3D adaptive toolpath is really meant to step down into complex pockets, but it can be used here because it is model aware. I wanna go ahead and I wanna hide the stock. So I'm gonna turn off display in process stock. Then I'm gonna go turn off my links and leads. So I'm only looking at cutting moves so we can see exactly what's happening here. So you can see the tool comes in, it sort of circles around and it begins to remove material. And as soon as it gets into any of these areas, you can see that the traces are starting to jump around. And this is done to keep, again, that consistent tool load. This, based on this example, the size of the tool isn't gonna be able to get in close enough for everything, but hopefully this gives you an idea of a way that we can speed up the process of machining. So now that we've seen this on a simple example, let's go ahead and take a look at how it works on a more complex example. So this board here has copper layers on both sides. The back side has a large ground plane, and this is gonna be problematic for the size tool I'm gonna to use. So I'm gonna focus on the top layer. So what we're gonna do is the same process. We're gonna go into manufacture, create a new setup. In this case, Z should be pointing the correct direction. But again, we do wanna change the model that we're using. Once again, I'm gonna select just the PCB. I am going to put the box point in the upper left-hand corner. And once again, I have metrics selected, so I'm gonna modify my units. And this isn't really critical because I'm not actually creating any G code. I'm not exporting it to a machine. I'm gonna assume that if you're wondering about machining your own PCBs, you probably have your own machine and you already know how to run it. So I'm not gonna be getting into creating the NC, the NC program or creating the G code. But from here, we're gonna follow the same process. We're gonna use adaptive clearing. I'm gonna pick the tool. Again, I'm just gonna go down to my fusion library, flat end mill, and just grab that 16th. I'm gonna use aluminum roughing. 
It's important that we don't use the aluminum slotting because some of the feeds and speeds in there are not going to work. And you'll notice here that use step down is true when we're on roughing. And you'll notice that some of these values for step downs change if we're using slotting or roughing. So some of them might throw an error or a warning depending on the tool path you're using. So now that we have our tool selected under geometry, again, machining boundary, I'm just gonna select the profile of the board. I'm gonna say, keep the tool inside. I'm gonna turn off rest machining and I'm gonna use the model override. Because a lot of these traces might be disconnected, I'm gonna go into the model in the browser and I'm gonna actually select one copper to make sure I get them all. Then I'm gonna deselect include setup model. Once again, I'm gonna to go to the heights and I'm simply gonna allow it to go to the top of the PCB. And I wanna turn off stock to leave. Generally, you would leave stock and you'd come back with a 2D contour to finish off. But again, just for this example, I wanna show how we can use the power of Fusion 360 and these adaptive toolpaths to clear out the majority. You'll notice because we didn't actually select the board, it is avoiding the holes. It doesn't even know that they're there because we told it that we had a boundary, but all it knows is that we're machining around those copper traces. So this can be extremely powerful. Um, it's going to depend a little bit on some of the settings that you use. So for example, the height is going to be above some of these traces. You'll notice that it's sort of going around on the top and then it's dropping down between here. If we wanna simulate this, we can navigate to simulate. I'm just gonna jump all the way to the end. And you can see that it is machining out those areas and it is leaving the geometry that we would expect. It does two depth passes and that's really based on the settings and the tool path based on the default values from the tool. If we go back to our setup, and we modify our stock, again, to make the stock top offset a bit smaller, I'm gonna make it 0 0.01, then we should only have a single pass. We're gonna to have to recalculate this, which can be done with Control or G, and then you can also go up to Actions and Generate to allow it to recalculate that based on the new stock value. Again, remember that these 3D toolpaths are model aware. They're looking for geometry in the criteria that you set, whether it's an angle specification, whether it's a machining boundary, or whether it's a set of selected faces or a model, it's gonna be looking for that geometry. You can also see that the size of the tool was not able to get into some of these areas. If we modify the tool, so for example, if I go in and edit the tool, this specific tool is going to be inside of my setup. It's not gonna modify the one in the library, but I can change the diameter. Instead of 0.0625, I'm gonna to go to 0.03125. Shaft diameter is gonna be the tool diameter, and I'm gonna leave everything else the same, except that, again, we have to recalculate. Control and G will do that. And then now it's gonna be using a smaller tool, which means it can get into smaller areas. This is going to, again, depend on your machine, the tools that you're using, the width of the traces, how close they are together. But hopefully you can see that this is a powerful way that we can use Fusion 360 to quickly machine around our traces. At this point, if you have any questions, please let me know. If you want to see more of this or have any specific examples, feel free to send them to me and I'll do my best to try to highlight any potential workflows or problems. But for now, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.